Welcome back from the break, everybody. So we're going to continue on with uh, the primitivism uh, theme of this of this session, uh, and in part two, we're going to talk really only about Picasso, and we're actually going to talk only about uh, mainly about one painting, uh, but it's. It's been deemed to be one of the most important paintings of early modernist of early modernist art, and the reason why uh, we're talking about it within this section is that it what what it has in common with what we talked about before in the first session um, is the idea of the female figure and of the non-Western other, um, the idea of Africa in this in in, in many in many instances, um, th their central themes. Um, within the painting, and in some cases, they allowed um, Picasso to resolve certain issues that he had with his with his paintings. So it's as if like uh, women and um, the racially other, the non-Western, allowed Picasso um, to to break through in his painting. In any case, that's been one of the um, um, one of the interpretations of this painting. Which again is not without its problems. So you have a number of more recent scholars who uh, who complicate this, and maybe argue that Picasso is actually in some ways reactionary. Um, certainly doesn't have an understanding of of let's say African tribal um, culture, um, and that this painting represents a certain amount of fear um of the of the racially other of the non-western and of women um s compatibly similar to the way we talked about at the end of part one uh where the the paint the, the the painting looks like it's a it's a moment of mastery but actually it's it's uh, symptomatic of of an anxiety of not having mastery and I think the reason everyone, so many, so many people are fascinated by by Picasso and Demoiselle d'Avignon, that's the that's the painting we're going to talk about the most today, is that there's a certain amount of ambivalence in the in in the painting. It's unclear um, if the painting is threatening the viewer, if the painting is threatening P Picasso, or if the viewer and Picasso are threatening um, or mistreating or or doing violence to the subjects with, within the painting. So the women. Um, and his references to African visual culture. So it's been endless, an endlessly fascinating painting for, for, for many scholars. Um, and that's what we're going to focus on for the second half of class. So with Picasso, um, I guess it's nice to go back and look uh, at some of his earlier work. So Picasso was one of those artists who was kind of a, um, a precocious um, genius as a, as a kid. Uh, he was an amazing draftsman. He was an amazing artist. Uh, the story goes is that it was his, his father who trained him, and then very quickly, supposedly, Picasso, even as a kid, even even in his childhood work, was exceeding the abilities um, and the artistry of his father. So it's interesting to look at these early works because they're, I mean, these are like academic nudes, um, academic studies. This is so far away from what Picasso will ultimately become as an artist, um, and especially um, the ultimate importance of Cubism, uh, which we're going to talk about later this week, but also of Demoiselle d'Avignon, as this real modernist breakthrough, it couldn't be any different from this early work. Uh, so it's nice to show you this. This is much more, this is like Renaissance drawing um, from, from his childhood work. Then he goes through a number of different phases. Uh, before he 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 has his Picasso uh, his his Picasso uh, breakthrough in the you know around 1906 1907 as your chapter as your chapter has it so in 1900 um, he's he's painting in a somewhat loosely impressionist uh, style maybe a bit uh, a hybrid between a certain type of realism and impressionism so this is his famous Le Moulin de la Galette. Le Moulin de la Galette was a famous cafe in Montmartre where Picasso was staying. Um, he's originally from Spain, um, and he goes back and forth um, um, during during these years. Uh, he goes through his celebrated periods, um, the Blue Period. So this is the old guitarist from 1903 to 1904. So a lot of his um, um, his panels were had a very blue key. So now it's called the Blue Period, and again, this is in this is still in a realist 
uh, a realist vein of painting. Um, it's a it's a beautiful painting um, of this sort of downtrodden um, guitarist uh, playing in the street like a street musician. And then he has his rose period. Um, this is his family of um, something bonk, um, these carnival circus people. Um, also in a realist vein, although here already it looks like um, Picasso is experimenting a little bit with um, with depth and amb ambiguity um, um, and different um, uh, different textures. So all these paintings are not without interest. I mean, if we were, if we were doing a class just on Picasso, we would we would want to go through all his his. Um, 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 all his key moments that he has before before cubism, but for an early 20th century class, what we're focusing on is this explosion of creativity that he has um, in beginning in 1906, 1907, up through the early teens, which is which is the the high point of of cubism. So really, today cubism proper, we're not going to get to, even though as you read in your book, the Demoiselle d'Avignon has been in the past has been considered to be like a proto cubist work or maybe like the, the first cubist work um, that's no longer really the way it's interpreted um, though certainly we could argue there's some connections it does sh sort of show the way but you'll see once we get to cubism proper on Thursday you'll see it's actually far it's not not at all um, what cubism is going to be in its full-fledged form which again is only going to be a few years later from 1907. So for today, what we're going to focus on is specifically on 1907 um, and Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Um, and so this is a nice photo. This is from 1910, so slightly later, um, like three years after he's painted Demoiselles d'Avignon. But this is his, the very famous Le Bateau Lavoir, which was um, a large structure, a large building in Montmartre um, in Paris. Today, if you visit Paris Montmartre is a it's pretty much a tourist destination now, uh, and it's a it's a lovely place to to visit. Uh, but in the early twentieth century, this was definitely let's say a bit more of the Bohemian um, area of Paris, where artists could have cheap spaces. Um, there would be cafes. Um, in some cases, it's not far from. Um, uh, uh, b brothels and nightclubs and that sort of thing, which is going to be part of Picasso's preoccupation, especially in Demoiselle d'Avignon. Um, but uh, along with a number of other artists, uh, Picasso was living in the Bateau Lavoir, and that's where he had for quite some time the Demoiselle d'Avignon. So we're not really going to go over the provenance because that's a little, a little dry. Um, you know, the history of of the, the painting itself. It's now in MoMA. Um, and here it is, uh, the, 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 the painting I've been talking about um, without showing you uh, the first half of the second half of class. Uh, this is the Demoiselle d'Avignon. This is what we'll be talking about for the rest of, rest of today. This is now in MoMA. Um, it's the, one of the most important paintings of the, of the collection um, as, as, as the way in which um, European modern art has, has been written. Uh, and MoMA's history has been written, even though MoMA in the past few years, um, and if anybody has seen the reopening, uh, they're trying to move away from this sort of monolithic uh, narrative of, of European of European modernism. How successful how su successful they are ultimately is uh, is up to us to decide. But for the longest time, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, this was like basically the beginning of of MoMA's collection and of, of the the narrative of modern art that they offered up for so many um, for so many years and decades really um, almost a century. So uh, this is Demoiselle d'Avignon, which he paints in uh, the Bateau Lavoir. Um, and I, again, I'm not going to go through the provenance because the the book does it does a good job sort of laying out. But it's interesting how this painting was really hidden from view from a long time from 1907. Um, to its ultimate public housing in MoMA in, what was it, 1937? And then ultimately becoming one of the most famous paintings of European modernism. Uh, 
it had it, it, it wasn't seen by that many people what was it a couple exhibitions and then um, uh, one of the owners one of the first owners even wanted to give it to the museum one of the museums in Paris and the museum in Paris didn't want it so really interesting early life of the material traveling um, of this painting um, the interpretations are also interesting so this is one of those paintings that have been written on written about to death uh, so many, so many people have written about this painting, and there, there are now a number of really canonical interpretations of the work. And so, one of the first ones would be, speaking of MoMA, Alfred J. Barr, who was the founder of MoMA all the way back in 1929. He's one of the first who starts to interpret this painting, um, and this is a complex history with Barr and modernism, but. In, if I'm, if I'm going to put it as briefly as possible, Barr, the founder of modern art, had a somewhat r reductive understanding of modernism, uh, that it was simply um, painting that calls attention to its own forms, um, that painters like Matisse, Picasso, and then once you get to even more abstract works that we're going to study later on this semester, the, the, the tying thread in all this history for Barr is that we're moving towards painting that's purely formal. Um, so it's interested in uh, shapes, it's interested in color, line, all the inherent properties of what painting can do, rather than, you know, um, more traditional forms of representation. So you might have guessed that for Barr, he interpreted this as simply a stop, uh, a stopgap, or like a stepping stone towards more formal paintings. Um, so he saw this as uh, an early cubist work or a proto-cubist work. Um, but the the content of the painting wasn't so interesting for him. Um, it was sort of incidental. He was reading the history of modern European art as a movement towards abstraction as a movement towards non-objectivity, as a movement towards the play of pure of pure forms. Um, and so that's all fine and good, um, and in some ways the, the, the painting fits in that, because I think your eyes can tell you that you have these four women, the demoiselles um, are all, they are made, they, are, they all do, do seem to be cut up and simplified into certain shapes, maybe slightly cubist shapes, um, a lot has been made. We're going to talk about this a little bit in next class about um, the, the upper torso of this of this um, uh, of this demoiselle up here. So there is a certain abstraction that's happening here, and Picasso is. <laughs> you can tell how far away he is from his early his early work, especially that childhood work that looked like you know exquisite draftsmanship. Of the, of the human body. So he's not interested in that anymore here. Um, he is interested in breaking up um, and, and working with uh, abstracted shapes. So in, in some ways, maybe it's, it's easy to see how this was such a compelling interpretation for the work. That's on the one hand, but, but on the other hand, there are all these things that are left out. Um, if this is just a formal exercise, if this is just a stepping stone towards cubism, then um, there are all these other aspects of the painting that are left unexplained. So the Iberian, uh, the, the faces of these three demoiselles are distinctly different from the faces of the, the two on the right here. Uh, so these have been traced uh, to an influence of Iber Iberian statues um, that uh, Picasso had uh, and was interested in. And then these, this is what we'll end with today, and this is how we get back to the idea of primitivism. The two women on, on the right, and these are the last editions of the painting. Uh, Picasso worked on this painting to death. Uh, these are African masks. These are tribal objects. These are African masks. And so the purely formal reading of this doesn't really explain the thematics of that, the incorporation um, the, the acculturation, the appropriation of non-Western visual culture isn't really explained um, by, by, by this painting, um, by, by the more formal interpretations of this, of this painting. Uh, nor are the thematics of the, the women themselves, um, nor are the thematics of the brothel, um, of prostitution, um, and what all that may, might have meant in 1907. 
So bar at first might seem compelling that yeah, this is we're getting towards abstraction, but there's a lot seems to be a lot missing. So along comes Leo, Leo Steinberg uh, in 1972, who writes an essay called The Philosophical Brothel. Um, and this is, this is one of those really canonical works in art history where every single graduate student, every single doctorate reads this, this essay um, when they're studying early 20th century art. Sometimes when you have a really famous painting, you almost have an equally famous interpretation of the painting um, and an essay that just like sticks, you know. Um, if you're going to write or, or, or think about this painting, you basically have to read and understand Leo Steinberg's philosophical brothel. Um, and it is a revolutionary, for the time, a revolutionary reading of the work. He's not convinced by the purely formal interpretation that Barr offers um, um, in the early 1950s. So, you know, a couple de decades later, Steinberg comes along, and unlike Barr, um, he starts to study all the different drawings that are associated with the Demoiselle. So all these preparatory sketches, all these studies that Picasso did for the painting, not only is Demoiselle like really worked over, like, you know, people have studied it and, and Picasso worked on it just laboriously, uh, but you also have... Um, a multitudinous amount of sketches and preparatory uh, studies for for the work, um, and so these were made available, newly made available, many of them around the time of, of Steinberg's writing, and so he started to, to use these to interpret the work, and he started to see that in fact Le Demoiselle d'Avignon is not just a proto-cubist work. It's not even at all a proto-cubist work. It's not just simply an abstraction of form. Um, there's, an, there's an important thematic happening in, in the work. Um, there's almost a, an allegory um, in the work. And he finds it, he traces it back to this one drawing. This drawing has become the drawing um, um, that's been most studied uh, and most interpreted of all the of all the drawings in the in the archive of preparatory sketches for Demoiselle d'Avignon. It's uh, a drawing called Medical Student Sailor and Five Nudes in a Bordello and it's even called Study for, for Demoiselle and we know when Picasso made it which would be a few months before he finished the, uh, the, the final painting. So uh, Steinberg studies this this drawing and it's a pretty fascinating interpretation. What it's really fascinating what he does. So he he looks at this drawing and he sees okay there are four, no five prostitutes. There are five demoiselles. They're here, and in some ways they kind of have already taken the shape that they're going to take in the painting. Um, the the most violently contorted one is the one on the right here with one of the African masks. It looks like she's squatting, but then like it's unclear if you're seeing the front or the back. And if it is her back, it's like her 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 head has been torqued all the way to the other side. So there's a certain amount of, of violence. She's already doing this really. I mean, it's kind of explicit. Uh, this squat here on the, on the right of the drawing, um, and then you have a few others. One coming in from behind a curtain, another who seems to be kind of posing, and then two more here. So these are the these are the the five uh, demoiselles who would be prostitutes in a brothel. This is a just a very in some cases a really traditional um, bordello scene, a scene of a of a bordello of a brothel. Um, so you have the five figures, but in this drawing you have two extra figures, uh, and these are the two male figures. So one you have the sailor who's inside the brothel who seems to be having a nice time. He's sort of assimilated within the scene. So this is, this is I guess, a cliche, but it was true that, that sailors were associated with brothels. Um, if, even if you like go back and do some of the, look at some of the research on this, the more like sociological research on this, there was a big fear of sailors at this time because it was widely thought that they carried venereal diseases like gonorrhea and syphilis. Um, so there was something almost like pathological. There was actually something kind of dangerous about this association with, with sailors. Um, and as it turns out, the biographical readings of these paintings, of this painting, is that Picasso very likely, we're pretty sure he had a real fear of brothels and a real fear of venereal disease um, like syphilis and gonorrhea, which was not curable yet in, in 1907. Um, so that may, that's definitely been part of the interpretations of the painting, so we might come back to that in a moment. Uh, but we have the sailor in the center here, 
Uh, and he's often, it's often noted how he's in front of, he's sitting right at a table and right in front of him is like this wine carafe thing with a spout that, that goes upwards. And so it's usually interpreted as, um, as sexual, as like a, an erection, right? Um, he's, he's the sailor. He's the one who seems to be at home in the brothel. Um, and he's the one sort of, um, 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 taking up the, the the pleasures that are available within within the brothel. Let's just put it that way. Then on the left you have another male character, um, and it's a guy. At one point he comes in carrying a skull and a book, but then um, in this later study he's only he only has the book, um, and he's the medical student. So he's the medical student that comes in. And so for Barr, uh, I'm sorry, not for Barr, for Steinberg, he makes a lot of this um, this this drawing to then reinterpret. Uh, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, and it's it's a really interesting interpretation. So he says that from the sketch to the final painting, Picasso has taken out the male figures, taken out the sailor, but implicitly he's kept them in. And you ask yourself, how did he keep those figures in? Uh, the way this is explained is that. Um, they're, they're kept in the painting explicitly through the way in which the painting is addressed by the viewer. So you got to imagine this is a scene that looks like a unified scene. It looks like a room, right? So when you go from the, the drawing to the final painting, imagine it being rotated 90 degrees so that the viewer in the, in the drawing is here on the left and is looking into the room. You see that? Like everything's been turned 90 degrees. So essentially what, what um, Picasso has done, he's made the viewer, he's made us, the male um, um, who's walking in on the scene. And by extension, the sailor, who his vantage point is looking down at the table. Notice he has like the fruit um, on, the, on the table here. Picasso has kept the fruit on the table in, in, the, in the final painting. So it's as if the male figures, the medical student and the sailor, have been kept in the painting through the, through the, the cipher of, the, of us, of the viewer. So the women are still there, but they're no longer looking inside the scene at the medical student who's come in and um, interrupted everything, but they're looking right at us. So in some ways, we become the medical student and the sailor, according to Steinberg. And for him, this is important because um, he thinks that the medical student and the sailor represent a certain allegory or a moral or a story, um, or maybe to put it better, um, they represent a fundamental dissonance um, that we all have. Um, this is almost like a fundamental human condition for uh, for someone like Steinberg um, and also for someone like Freud. We'll end up talking about Freud a little bit. Um, we'll see. But we might talk about Freud again a little bit because he's been invoked in this painting, in interpretations of this painting. So Steinberg says that, that this painting thematizes the fact that we are, we're always conflicted. We're conflicted between our impulses to, 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 to have pleasure. So in this case, it's sex. Um, the, the, and that's represented by the, the, um, the sailor. Um, but on the other hand, we also have this drive to be detached and to try to want to learn um, um, and to put off pleasure in order to um, gain something else, right? Um, insights, knowledge, wisdom, so on and so forth. So that, of course, is represented by the medical student who almost looks like he's about to, he's just come in and maybe he's about to walk out, but he's just kind of objectively looking at the scene. And so in the final painting, uh, it's as if we, we become both of them in one, which then means we're riven between our impulse to, to, to have pleasure, right? Um, or to have sex, but then also the the drive we have for knowledge and maybe even caution right the idea that oh maybe we shouldn't um, we should think about what it means um, um, to, to to traffic in pleasures 
because it might mean that certain pleasures might actually be harmful for us, or they they might uh, there might be some consequences, right? So it's as if the viewer is encoded as um, um, as these two figures, according to, to Leo Steinberg. This also then explains uh, the way that the, the painting is set up, because a lot of people have noted that while the drawing is this unified scene, the painting is kind of a mess. Um, it's not at all clear how the figures relate to one another. You have these three, uh, these three here, and then the two here. This one in the back seems to be standing, more or less like the one in the preparatory drawing, and she's opening this curtain. This one is also still squatting, so I mean, I guess you could say that these two are in, in a similar scene. But then, uh, a similar, like, spatial, spatial relationship. But then notice the two uh, demoiselles in the center, they're not at all standing. It's very clear that they're, they're, they're lying down. Um, it's as if they're kind of already in bed. Um, and so we've moved from being, being looked at or looking at two prostitutes, two demoiselles that are standing in a room, all of a sudden it bleeds into a completely different um, spatial orientation where we're now kind of on top of the demoiselle looking down onto them um, on their bed, naked on their bed, right? And, you know, this is, this is quite clear because they have bed sheets. Um, she is either pulling them down or pulling them up, and this one also have bed, has bed sheets. And then this one, um, who has a hand that's sort of floating up in the air, it's unclear like who it belongs to in the preparatory drawing. Um, um, it looks like it's either from the medical student um, or from this demoiselle, unclear here. So an another discordant spatial um, um, space in the painting. And then this demoiselle is clearly standing, right? So between themselves, these, these figures are not at all unified. It's not at all clear what it is that unifies them. And this is where Steinberg comes in and offers up another interpretation that's related to the first. He says, well, the very thing that unifies this painting is the spectator. And it's us that makes sense. Like, we're the, we're the point of organization um, that's able to see all this, like the grounding point of all these different, um, all these different perspectives. And so this is one of those places where um, people have read read in uh, this work as a proto-cubist work because maybe it is already showing more than one perspective at once. Um, though we'll see that's that's kind of a simplistic understanding of cubism, but that's that's for Thursday. Um, and so the book finishes up with additional interpretations of, of the work that are that are related. Um, so one is to think of this work almost like a Medusa. Uh, Freud wrote a pretty famous essay about the Medusa. Um, um, Caravaggio, Baroque painter, one of the great Baroque painters, Italian Baroque. He probably has the most famous painting of the Medusa. Um, and you may know a little bit about the Medusa, a myth mythological figure. She's a, a, um, um, this sort of female monster that has snakes for hair. Um, and if you saw her directly, you would be turned to stone. You would be, you would be killed. Um, and so Freud, of course, had a field day with this, saying that actually Caravaggio and the idea, the, the, the story of the Medusa is nothing other than uh, castration anxiety. So the idea for Freud, he thought that men uh, had, a, had a, a fear of, of being castrated, of, of being impotent. Um, and there is a long, complex theory as to why this would be the case. Um, if you want to read about it, um, you want to read Freud's very short uh, essay called um, On Fetishism, where he talks about the origins of, of castration anxiety. So we don't have time to go into that, into that here. Um, but there is a way in which you can make a parallel between the Medusa, the Medusa, who's a, a, female, uh, a female kind of monster, um, as a figment of the imagination of, 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 of Greek mythology, of, of being able to kill by, by looking, by the gaze, um, and turning to stone. So um, <clears throat> that can double as a, sort of a sexual metaphor, um, at least for um, the, the male anatomy. 
right? Um, which gets back to the castration anxiety. So this is a look that can kill, but also make hard, turn to stone, right? Um, there's a way in which some scholars, like Rosalind Krauss, who wrote the, our chapter, she says that, that basically what Picasso has done is he's made a painting of five Medusa-like figures, like the whole painting becomes a Medusa, where it's staring at us in a very threatening way, um, it has the ability, these are prostitutes, so there's the ability to sort of entice, um, to give off a sexual look, to make hard, right, just like the, the, the Medusa. But then, of course, it's also uh, um, quite a threatening gaze. These women are, are these, these prostitutes um, who, who are very well the figments of the imagination of Picasso himself, uh, who had a fear of of bordellos who had a fear of venereal diseases um, they actually have a there's a threatening look in the same way that that, that medusa is i don't know how um i don't know how sold i am on that that interpretation um i guess it's it's kind of sexy but uh um, not really so uh i don't know how i don't know how um uh, um, how persuasive this is as an interpretation, um, but I still go through it since it's mentioned in the book, and it might actually be one of the more com confusing passages in the text. Essentially, what Krauss is saying is that demoiselles they become like the Medusa, and it means that the pa this painting is encoding this sort of fear um, that Picasso had over over the female form and over. Um, over uh, brothels, which then gets us to our final point, which is the other fear that Picasso had, and this brings us full circle to the idea of primitivism, which is why this is in this um, this session. So not only is Picasso evoking the female body as this threatening, as this enticing um, uh, figure uh, for Picasso, but also a threatening one. Um, I think we've we've established that pretty well. Notice how that grafts that echoes and parallels the idea of primitivism primitivism perfectly, right? Because the, the whole impulse of primitivism, one of the one of the central um, um, mechanisms within primitivism, is the European, who's both fascinated by the non-Western, in this case, African visual culture, Af African. Um, um, human beings who, who have their own cultures, but also fearful of them, also um, wary of them, and then of course this leads to um, derision and, and, and <coughs> imperialism and and, um, um, and, and subordination and and, and, and and racism really. Um, so it's as if that 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 binary uh, of both fascination and fear. Um, which may very well be encoded in Steinberg's interpretation of the medical student and the sailor. One is super fascinated and is ready to um, 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 is ready to, to to give in to his pleasures, and then the the medical student is more fearful and more cold and objective and calculated. Uh, that's an imperfect analogy, uh, but maybe there's some way in which we could read read these together. But definitely, the the primitivist impulse is makes its mark both on the female body and the non-Western body. And in Picasso's painting, they're they're conflated, they're put together. So of course you have the female body, the the prostitute, um, but then also the the recourse to the African masks on on, on the right. Um, as these what Picasso called weapons, like he understood. Um, these masks to be in some ways weapons that could ward off evil. This was his understanding of of African masks and of tribal objects that he would see. This is probably one of the most famous museum visits of any artist. Um, in 1907, he went to the the ethnic ethnography museum, um, the Trocadero, in 1907, and he he's written about this, interviewed about this, and he says. This was a really formative moment for me. I was scared to death in this museum. These masks were, were scary. Um, and he says, the Demoiselle d'Avignon must have been born on that day. So like he makes, a, he makes a conscious connection between these masks that were frightening to him 
um, and this painting. Um, so then the painting itself almost becomes this warding off of evil. Um, it's both a manifestation of this, this the, 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 the fearful woman um, and the fearful dark continent that Freud, you know, that Freud taught, um, uh, called both women in Africa, um, as I mentioned in our first chapter. But it's also a way in which Picasso is kind of warding it off. Um, and here he is in his... Um, in his studio and we know that he actually collected um, a number in some cases they were stolen and he had to give them back uh, but a, a number of tribal objects and they were a key influence um, for, for his work um, so we'll leave it at this um, this is very interesting right because there's a way in which for a long time art historians have have looked at Picasso and said wow look he's looking at African objects he's looking at non-western cultures and usually that meant uh, that this was a coincidental thing, that there's something about modern art, this, uh, this impulse to abstract, this impulse to make more elemental shapes. Um, this, was, this could have been uh, simply a coincidence that you know tribal objects also have this sort of impulse to abstract. There's also a more stylized, um, sometimes geometric, um, or, or non-objective relationship between the object um, and, and the world. But that doesn't really work, um, especially knowing what we know now. Um, he was actually directly influenced by, by the look of, of, these, of these objects and this visual culture. Um, and the way he's influenced is through a misreading. Because right, he doesn't really know what these objects are about. He just assumes they're all weapons, that they're all these scary things. And he can use them in his paintings um, to ward off his own fears and his own desires, right? Um, so there's there have been a, a much more astute reading of this painting, much more recently by scholars who are more savvy about this primitivizing impulse. And then also the very real colonial history that... Um, undergirds this whole painting and Picasso and his career and Europe itself, right? The reason why these objects can be in his studio is because of a long history of colonialization um, and the the um, basically, you know, the taking of these visual cultures from non these visual these these objects from non-Western visual cultures um, and the whole um, really sad and nefarious history that colonialism was. So to read this painting as Barr does, as we talked about at the beginning, as purely a formal exercise as a proto-cubist work, not only misses the, the importance of the, the, and the problematic relationship of the female form um, and the masks and, and African visual culture, but it completely evacuates the history um, that made this painting possible. And like I said at the beginning, uh, this might actually then make this painting somewhat reactionary uh, and kind of politically conservative. Um, even maybe you might argue in some ways uh, colonialist. Right? So you'll have a lot of um, interesting feminist thinkers and, and um, art historians who are attuned to the history of decolonization and post-colonialism and, and the history of colonialism um, actually looking less favorably on this painting um, then let's say an art historian who who's not um, well versed in in those fields. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that. At that, I think I went a little too much, but this is just one of those paintings where, I mean, I, I honestly, uh, by the end of it, I would be bored out of my mind. But it's true that you could almost spend a whole semester just on this one painting. That's how important and how much has been written. Um, and talked about this painting. So we're going to leave it at one session, um, and then and then on Thursday we'll go to full-fledged. We're not done with Cubism yet. We're not done with Picasso yet. We're going to talk about Cubism on Thursday, but um, we'll leave it with with uh, we'll leave it here with Demoiselle. I've definitely given you more than enough ideas to um, start navigating this picture a bit and sort of understand why it's. Uh, why it's problematic, but also um, an important one for uh, the history of European modernism. Take care, everybody.